and welcome to my psychology section of my library. So I'm going to start actually with uh, a journal that I was sent. It's just sort of related to psychology, but not really. Anyways, the first few letters are, but this is the Journal of Psychohistory. So this is for 2010, uh, volume 37. Um, the Journal of Psychohistory is is about the um, the thesis, perhaps, which I think is a very interesting one, that the conditions of 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 humanity in terms of war and in terms of government and the role of governments um, and uh, domestic violence and and well violence in general and aggression in general behavioral problems in school all of these things come down to and and you can take any point in history they come down to how children are parented and I think that if you take a minute to think about it, it's a humongous proposition. So um, if you are able, usually academic journals are they're expensive to view unless you're going through a school or a university. But the Journal of Psychohistory has some very interesting articles. Um, there's a few in this one, but there's other ones, of course, as well. And I think there's a book. Um, the uh, the, the uh, beginner of uh, psychohistory stuff is Lo Lloyd DeMoss. I think it's D-E and then M-A-U-S-E, something like that. So anyways, you should definitely check him out because he that's a, it's a very interesting premise to a lot of the um, sources of aggression today. If you think about it, if children are raised by the rod... How do they function as adults? What is normal to them? So that kind of stuff. And so I think it's a very interesting uh, premise. So this is so this is a psychology stuff. So this is probably a pretty short video, but um, so here's is a textbook, cognitive psychology, in and out of the laboratory, third edition. Um, I'm just gonna see what the year is here. I usually don't keep textbooks around. This is 04 because they go out of date pretty quickly and then, then they're useless because academic research is very quick. So especially when you're when you have a discipline like a, like a science where new research is coming out every year like classics and philosophy that kind of stuff that that stuff takes a long time to develop and stuff doesn't really go out of date and it's also crucial to read the old stuff but to read the old science and is not it's not as important so textbooks science textbooks are not as worthwhile to keep around uh, here's a book I actually picked up just recently just to have so this is by Abraham Maslow so he is uh, a classical psychologist for sure and this particular one is called toward a psychology of being um, Maslow is mostly known for his hierarchy of human needs. Uh, you should check that out if you've never heard of that. Just Google Google that, hierarchy of human needs, and go to Google image, and it, it'll show a pyramid. And just have a look at that. You don't have to read anything. Um, and that's pretty interesting to look at that. But um, I had to have this because it was by Maslow, and I've used Maslow in my, uh, in my master's. So I had to have that. Second edition says... Let's see, this is 68, 1968. Okay, this is a book that I use quite often. So The Scientist in the Crib, uh, what, what Early Learning Could Tell Us About the Mind. So this is by Alison Gopnik and uh, Meltsoff and uh, Cool. These are all, this is a developmental psychology book, basically. So we've got lots of references in it. Although it's written um, a very, it's an it's an easy to read. It's not an academic. It's not it's not written academically, which usually means it's it's very dense and difficult. This is written very nicely. Uh, it's a quick to read through, and it has all the references. So it's it's a win win for me since I need both. Uh, or well, I don't need both. I need the references though. But it's nicer to read if it's uh, if it's in this. 
format as opposed to academic works that are that can be uh, more difficult to get through. Uh, less coherent, uh, less well written, but this is very well written. Uh, so this is developmental psychology about children and their um, their abilities and as they develop from birth. And there's all kinds of evidence to suggest that learning is an innate ability and is not something that needs to be uh, inculcated or instructed. So, in my opinion, it is it is a um, it is evidence against uh, it is evidence to um, criticize this uh, education and schooling. So. Here's a book that I read up at, uh, in my master's, but I liked it, and from the library, but I liked it so much I bought a copy to have it uh, at home. So this is, um, it's called So Neurodiversity by Armstrong. It's fairly new. I think it's probably 2010, actually. But this actually looks at mental disorders in a more positive light, looking at the abilities. Um, oh, no, I'm losing my battery. I'll have to be right back. Get my, I have to plug in my netbook here. Okay, I'm back. I had to plug in my netbook. Uh, I don't know where I was though. I think I was talking about this one. Or no, 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 I, I was talking about this one, actually. Okay, um, yeah, look, looking at those, those disorders in a positive light. Discovering the extraordinary gifts of autism, ADHD, dyslexia, and other brain differences. Most of the time, those things, especially in education, are looked at as bad. So ADHD is bad. We need to... Um, we need to get kids to pay attention, or we need to slow them down with Ritalin because they're too hyperactive. Um, dyslexia, obviously, we need to correct that. Um, autism, that's well, hardly correctable, but um, so they look. So this looks at them in a more positive light. What are the uh, the abilities and benefits of of perhaps those things? How how, if mental illness is not something that was just discovered like, you know, 80 years ago, but it's been something that the human race has lived with for a long time, just never identified, just like x-rays. X-rays were discovered, but before human beings knew of them, they existed. They just were not given a name and were not identified through science. If mental illness is the same thing, if it's always been around, but just now, like 80 years ago, they were starting to identify them and name them, then... There must be all kinds of ways that these things were used in society. So, it's a pretty good book on that topic. Okay, here is by, this is by Steven Pinker, uh, The Language Instinct. So, I actually picked this up from a student um, up when I was doing my master's uh, for 10 bucks. So, Steven Pinker is a pretty uh, well-known cognitive psychologist, evolutionary psychologist, um, and he does all kinds of stuff on language. And so this is basically an account of language being an innate phenomenon in terms of um, it coming about. As long as there's other people to model, uh, many um, abilities that come out of a human baby are from imitation and modeling. If um, it, it's again, it's the reason why I have it is that it is attacking the education system because it, it uh, removes the assumption that a child needs direct ins instruction to learn and instead uh, realizes that children simply need access to models to learn. So they need to hear. If they can hear language, then they can develop. Uh, they can develop their ear to the syllables and the sounds of the language. Uh, for those who don't know, um, different languages have different uh, sounds. And when you're a baby, depending on what you're listening to from your parents, your ears will tune to those sounds, which means that you also forget to some sounds. There are some diff there. For example, there are two different A sounds in the Indi in uh, um, in languages in India, uh, as well as in Chinese, you probably have have heard of the R and the L. The Chinese do not distinguish between R and L. Uh, so those kind of things at birth, those are um, those things are ad adjusted or 
uh, tuned. Uh, so that's they talk about the critical period, for example, and uh, so language is is something that is developed as the brain develops in that young age, and uh, so that's why, for example, they say that if you want to learn a language, if you want your child to be able to speak a language in the native tongue and not be like a a, a francophone, like someone who learns a language later, so you may know the words but you don't have the accent. The accents form when they're very young. So if you expose them to the language and they're very young, they will pick up the accent. Not not because not just because then they can speak the language and speak with the tongue and the accent, but they can hear the sounds. That's what the important part is. Okay, this book. Social Intelligence. So Daniel Goleman. Uh, so what it means to be smart. Redefine what it means to be smart. The New Science of Human Relationships. I have not read this. I was given this was a gift uh, from someone a long time ago. Or, uh, years ago. Many years ago, sort of. Um, it's, uh, it's likely um, broadening our, our view of intelligence, such as uh, Howard Gardner's Multiple Intelligences. So, for example, in schools, we, we mostly focus on abstractions and logic for our intelligence. But according to multiple intelligences, there's all kinds of other ones. There's being able to, uh, um, there's all kinds of hearing intelligences and acting and moving your body and tactile. And there's all kinds of, you could even pop, you could even really think you could like remove the word intelligence and think of it as a different way as abilities or or um, proficiencies rather than intelligence. But okay, a couple left here. So this is just psychology. So this is uh, just a textbook, I guess. Children with exceptionalities in the Canadian classroom. So I ho held on to this just for a reference. The seventh edition. It's very. It's a nice textbook, so I kept it. Um, I guess I think I bought this in my master's, or it might have been teachers' college. I think it was teachers' college. And uh, what is this? 2005. So first printed in '93. So this is a pretty good, uh, pretty good textbook for mental disorders. And physical physical disabilities, I guess just disabilities in general. Okay, this is a book I recently bought at a used bookstore for, I don't know, four bucks or so. The Moral Animal, Why We Are the Way We Are, The New Science of Evolutionary Psychology. So I thought that was a pretty interesting title, so I wanted to grab that. Uh, it's by Robert Wright. And it is 1994. So this is a nice used copy. Um, so it looks like it's got Darwin in here. What else does it have? I haven't read it yet. I only got it about a week ago. Um, part 1, Sex, Romance, and Love. Part 2, Social Cement. Part 3, Social Strife. Part 4, Morals of the Story. Darwinian and Freudian cynicism. That's actually something I don't have. I don't think I have anything on Freud. No, nope. I don't have any psychology stuff on Freud. So, so for example, it asks: Is monogamy natural for me? Is it natural for animals? Is another question. Uh, is it natural for women? Where does sibling uh, rivalry come from? Stuff like that. Where does uh, bullying come from in uh, classrooms with all the same ages? Is that a natural phenomenon? Here's a caveat for you from psychology. Is a classroom a natural environment? Has it become a natural environment? Is a room with 30 kids your own age when you're in elementary school, is that a natural environment? And how does that compare to the family? That's something I've been, I've been uh, interested in recently. So... Like normally, unless you're you know, unless you have twins, you have a older or younger sibling, right? If obviously if you're a not an only child, that is a natural family setting, and that is the normal setting. 
basically just by chance, right? Unless there's twins, which is rare. But in a school setting, it is, uh, except for historically with one-room schoolhouses that had multiple ages, and there are multi-age classrooms today, but they're rare. Um, the normal uh, sense is you are in a classroom with 25 or 20 or 30 other kids your own age. And I think that is a source of um, competition and bullying. But that's something, that's just something you know, completely different. Okay, so the next section I'm going to do is education. It's going to be a long one. I've got a few books here too. But I certainly have more. As I, I just did a few psychology, psychology books and I had a few things to say about Ed, but that's what I do in grad. So, okay, I will do next will be education. I actually forgot a book from my psychology section. So it is a textbook, but it is a very interesting one. This one's called Abnormal uh, Psychology. Second edition. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the chapters, because there are some interesting chapters in here, which is perhaps uh, not normal for a textbook. So chapter one, Concepts of Abnormality Throughout History. So that is a that could be a book in itself, because unfortunately, mental illness is relative, relative to the times. What we call mental illness today is not going to be the same that we call it in 50 years from now. And it wasn't the same 100 years from now. Uh, for example, those who, who know of the DSM, uh, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual, so this is like the Bible for psychologists to diagnose and psychiatrists to diagnose people with a mental disorder or whatever. The DSM-5 is coming out, I think, I think it's next year or it came out this year. I'm not sure now. I kind of lost touch with that. Um, I was taking a course during my master's in it. Um, but anyways, so those things change over time. What we consider, what do we consider normal? So that, that stuff's just huge. What do we consider normal today? And what then what's abnormal? And when are you across that bound? So anyways, that's just, it's a humongous question, I think. And I think it's a humongous uh, difficulty of con uh, conceptualizing mental illness. But anyways, uh, what else? There was something else here I wanted to talk about a little bit here. So then it goes through all the different uh, classifications. Oh, I know what it was. Therapy. So also a lot of psychology, psychological disorders and all that, a lot of them today are... I think I did a video on this, the Quick Fix Society. I did a, um, you know, a, a blog or whatever, like a, one of my commentary videos, I guess, about the Quick Fix Society that much of mental illness today isn't cured. It is, I'm not, I wouldn't even call it treated, but it is not prolonged, but it is kept in stasis somewhat with drugs. They, they use drugs to to remove symptoms, but to not remove or even attempt to remove causes. And that's where I think therapy can come in. Um, there has, from my own knowledge, that there are all kinds of therapies that one can like, at least try to um, alleviate symptoms in mental for mental disorders. For example. Uh, PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress. So if you have a traumatic event that happens in your life, or such as a childhood event, that can cause a, that can cause great distress. That can give you anxiety, enough for a disorder. And those kind of things can be cured in, in quotation marks with therapy and not with drugs. So in terms of, and I guess that's related to the um, medical model of mental disorders in general historically it's been a it's been a medical model even uh, modernly whereas we really need to broaden our our view of it and even and use more and more therapy uh, for example there's um cognitive uh, cbt uh, cognitive behavioral therapy 
So, anyways, I really want to stress that instead of just taking drugs, it doesn't uh, chemical imbalances. Chemical imbalances can be maintained. It can be monitored with drugs, but you'll be taking those drugs for your entire life, and you'll be seeing your doctor to get your prescription modified or try a different drug. Or it's just a mess. Why not try therapy? Because those chemical imbalances, they can be caused by events in your life, as opposed to a genetic. If it's a genetic disorder, then obviously that's that's the source. But the source of chemical imbalances sometimes are not genetic. They can be from changes in the brain. So anyways, that's why there is, uh, there's also a chapter here on ethics because that mental illness and ethics is, it's a huge, and mental health is a huge uh, topic. Anyways, so that's my psychology section. So next I'm going to do my uh, education section and then I'm going to do my um, so a few books I have that are from school uh, or from the library I mean that I'm working on now I'm getting through now so until next time <laughs>